This is, this is what my friends in Mulu call the geomythology. It's, uh, you've seen what's actually there, and this is my attempt to explain what's actually there, which they all say is a bunch of rob rubbish anyway, but uh, let's see how we go. So I'm going to start plowing the same furrow that several other people have done. What do we mean by big? Ruth talked about volume, and we're defining large chambers as being in terms of volume, or is it surface area? If you're an engineer and you're designing something, the thing that's important is how wide it is, the span. And the idea is that once you make one element which stands up successfully, like this did, ooh, uh, then actually you can make it go back any sort of distance you want, and what you have is then a linear chamber, which is a tunnel like this one. Ooh, that one didn't stand up either. So to get some idea how this fits in with sort of the engineering view of things, because chambers are essentially mechanical devices, here's the RGS Lecture Theatre, which we've already scanned. 21.4 metres across. This is the world's largest underground man-made chamber. It's uh, the Jovic Fell Hall in Norway. It's got a nice hockey pitch in the, minute, in the middle of it, and it has a span of 61 metres. This is Sarawak Chamber. You've all seen the slide before. The span that I've measured here is 410 metres. So there's something going on here. You know, this is the largest thing that an engineer would make without laughing hysterically and dashing off for his insurance profile. And this is what's actually standing up in the real world. What's happening? Here's a slide from Tony Waltham. And it, it's plotting up practical values. Engineers are practical people. They look at things. They find things that stand up. They find things that fall down. They put a line between them. And they build the things that stand up. This is Q value here, which is essentially a measure of the strength of the rock versus the width of the cavern up this side through here. And you can see there are coal mines here and Nottingham caves, not the parochial at all, limestone caves. And here's our Govic Stadium. It's just up there, just on the boundary between what's stable down here and what's unstable up there, which the engineers wouldn't build. But look where all our big cha cave chambers and passages are. They're all up in these impossibly large widths, which you'd need super strong rock for. There's Sarawak chain. So there's, there's kind of an issue here that we, that we need to think about. Why are engineers unable to make things this large, whereas clearly we find they do stand up? Well, perhaps the, the question is that they don't stand up. When you get to Sarawak chamber, it's like a limestone quarry with the lights switched off. You know, it's basically chaos. There are blocks falling out from the roof all over the place. So clearly they don't stand up. They all fall down. That's not actually true. We've dated some of the speleothem out of Sarawak Chamber, and there are actually more than three there. Um, and we, we can do it two ways. First of all, we can find stalagmites, which previously were on the roof, stalactites, which were previously on the roof. This one grew between 80,000 years and 31,000 years. And at 31,000 years, it fell off the roof, dropped on the floor, and I came along later and picked it up and dated it. So perhaps the roof fell down 31,000 years ago, or the stalagmite fell off the roof, which is much more likely. We can also look at fill, which is on the floor of the chamber here, which has got stalagmites on the top of it. And when indeed we can look at quartz in the fill and get cosmogenic ages. And the ages we've got there are of the order of 80 to 90,000 years. So Sarawak Chamber has been standing up virtually as it is for at least 100,000 years. It's stable. So how else do we know these things are stable? Well, Andy talked yesterday about the idea that there's a, an evolutionary sequence in caves. Caves go through a development stage. Sarawak Chamber is getting bigger as we talk, um, but there are also senile stages. This is a senile cave. It's a, it's Marco Polo chamber in China, and it's full of stalagmite. The void is being filled up by stalagmite growth in it. And if you look, the stalagmite isn't broken. There's stalactites on the roof. There's no breakage of columns. You go to the gowers, there aren't blocks all over them. So that's stable. It's standing. There are two ways you can make chambers stand up. This is the conventional view. The idea is that you have a series of beams that the rock's made out of, the individual beds, which have joints in them. And there's a maximum width that you can get a beam to stand before it cracks in the middle. You can see the incipient crack through here, and it falls down. But that roof beam is supported by a whole series of cantilevered beams down below it. 
Now, the only problem with this as a model for forming large spans is that to get the sort of spans that we want, you have to have beds which are impossibly uh, large. And you can see that for some chambers, this is cloud ladder hall here, the beds clearly are not thick, rather the reverse. If anything, they're rather on the thin side. So this is now looking up at cloud ladder hall, and uh, this is an external view through here. You can see a couple of joints, and you can see there are a series of concentric bands, and indeed, as we get towards the top, there are a series of flat surfaces, and these are individual bedding planes dipping in this direction. This is looking up at the roof, and you can see the same pattern again. So it's pretty clear that, that this conventional model for, uh, for stability in caverns is appropriate in Cloud Ladder Hall. It has a span of 148 metres. But actually, the critical thing is that it's built slowly up, bed by bed by bed, up to this eventual stable roof up through there. So we get a chamber which is very, very high, and in fact, many of these chambers are only present in limestones that are thick, because otherwise it would have simply broken through the surface and we'd have a Tian Kang formed. So this is a slow and steady model. You build chambers which are gradually supported as the thing, think the stream cuts down, the roof stokes its way up, and you end up with something that's relatively stable, tall but quite narrow. This is what's called a discrete element model. In other words, what we do is we focus on the individual elements in the rock, in this case, the individual beds and the strength of the individual beds, and that tells you how things stay up. The other way to think about a rock is to think about it as a homogeneous medium. The example Andy gave you yesterday was of a soil um, where there are individual grains. We can't predict the behavior of the individual grains, but we can predict on a whole, the way the soil will behave. It's called a homogeneous medium. Here's a numerical model for a, for a homogeneous me medium above a void tunnel in this particular case. And essentially, the load in the, uh, above the chamber is borne by the stress being diverted along a compression or voussoir arch, uh, which diverts the load through to the margins through here. And this is the conventional principle we use in building bridges, of course. The critical thing is that where the, the rock is in compression, it's extremely strong. Where the rock is in tension, which is below the voussoir arch or the compression arch, the rock is extremely weak. And so immediately, we're likely to get this part of the roof of the cavern falling. So do we see chambers like this? Yes, we do. Colin showed you this picture before. Here's the compression arch. There it is going over through here. Here's the material that fell out because it was under tension below it. This is Appy Chamber. And the critical thing is, can you see any bedding there? Can you see any joints there? Well, yeah, there is bedding. That's the bedding. Does the chamber take any notice of it? No, because it's, the rock is behaving as a homogeneous medium. You can see this in other examples. This is a a laser image. My laser images are not anywhere near as clever as Rue's are. This is the inside of the chamber. We're looking at the back wall of the chamber. I've cut the front half off so you can see in. Here's the bedding. We can see beds there. There are the beds. They're very, very thick, getting on for 50 metres or so. But look what the roof looks like. It's a smooth arch, and it's at a very, very low angle. This is the sort of image you, I want you to think about because the implication of this angle with which the, the strain is being taken, the, the uh, strain is being, the stress is being taken out into the adjacent rocks is actually uh, quite important. Can we see evidence of what this means in practice? This is, uh, this is um, Lagan's cave. It's a big cave passage, sort of 40, 50 metres wide. And the critical thing here is it looks like the roof just fell in one single event. If you look you can match individual pieces of the boulders all the way through here. And so, essentially, this, the failure between the original solution form and the mechanically stable voussoir arch, which is what is actually present in the roof at the moment, was a catastrophic event. All this lot dropped out in a single go, and it's on the floor, and you can walk along it for several kilometres. Here's another example of this what the arch does in terms of the erosion. This is Miao Chamber. It's the central part of Miao Chamber. There's the Vuzoar Arch. We can see it very nicely. Here's the streamway here, which is excavating everything behind. And this is a massive pillar. Look what's happening. All the rock is falling from the pillar because it's under tension. 
This is all in compression. There's an enormous area here which has got toppling towers that are falling down into the central part of the chamber through here. And the normal way is to go in a little passage around the back here, which again is underneath that arch. So the stability of the arch is not in question. The material underneath it is what's failing on a continuous basis. And in fact, what's interesting is that there's also adjustment of these arches through time. And that doesn't occur by great chunks falling down. It occurs by little splinters and flakes falling off. You find them all over the floors of the chambers. The little bits that just drop off, the arch has widened a little bit, and so it's not in a stable configuration anymore. And pop, 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 little bits fall off like this. Um, this is Sarawak Chamber. Here's our arch again. And because of that bridge analogy, because the arch... The, the, the load from above is being taken uh, out into the surrounding rock at a relatively low angle. All the rock in the chamber margins is also under the arch and is also not being held up by anything. There isn't anything holding it. If you can excavate the chamber volume here, then, bong, everything will fall off. This is the rear wall of Sarawak Chamber. There's a 20-metre-high flake here, which is completely detached at root roof level for over 160 metres. And this is an area of the chamber which has massive roof blocks, or massive blocks in it. They're not from the roof, they're from the back wall falling out and running down the slope 300 metres, eventually down to the streamway below. So there are two forms, stable forms of chambers, the cantilever beam model and the voussoir arch model. And there's actually a third form of chamber, and these are unstable. These are intrinsically falling to pieces around us. And it's back to a discrete element model. We need to understand the behaviour of the individual, individual elements in the rock if we're going to understand how the chamber stands up. These are called ravels or ravel stopes. Why they're not called unravel, I don't know, ask the engineers. And the idea is that, is that basically you form some sort of stable arch, but there's something that doesn't actually allow the configuration of the arch to become stable. There may be joints, there may be bedding, there may be a weak bed of rock, uh, as there is here. So let's go back to Lagan's Cave. Here's the nice arch that I've shown you before with all the bits that fell out of the roof. And if we go over into the corner here, here's a ravel. This is the bedding. This, the cave is excavated along the strike. Here's a bedding, and here's a lump that's just dropped out of the roof. Now at that point, that arch is now failed because it's got a bloody great notch in it. And so at some point, Langan's Cave is going to have to adjust to that. Here's a picture I've shown you before. It's the Vouzoir Arch into Appy Chamber. Jolly good, all very stable, lovely photograph, etc., etc. Actually, all the volume in Appy Chamber is not in this first bit here. It's in this second bit, which is beyond the section through there. Keep an eye on this boulder. It's the same boulder that we see over there, but seen from the other side. Here's the dip. You can see these dipping bedding planes through here. And the whole of this area of the chamber is a gigantic raveling stoke. You can see bits sliding down the bedding, and lots of little block detachments through here. This is where all the volume in the chamber comes from because ravels allow you to get uh, for the roof to collapse and to come down, so you get not only the area, but you also get the height as well. In fact, Appy Chamber is, is probably one of the more interesting ones we've been to because it has three stages of development. The first stage is not on this, this diagram through here. Um, it's where active collapse above the present streamway is occurring. This is the Vouzoir Arch, which is the first attempt. The rock says, whoa, this is getting big. Can't cope with it. I'll form a stable arch. And then the third stage says, sorry, mate, this rock's not good enough for the stable arch span that you want. We're going to have a raffle. You get the volume. But eventually, this is going to, going to fall down and fill itself up. When you have a look at Meow Chamber, Meow Chamber is actually, like Appy, a composite chamber. It has a raffle here, a stable arch in the middle, which is where I showed you all those rock pillars coming down, and it has another ravel at the end here. And the ravels tend to be high compared to their width. The arches tend to be wide compared to their height. Right. Clearly one of the things we have to do is we have to make sure there's enough, there's enough um, erosion going on to both clear the debris out from the, from the, uh, from the 
uh, from the cave, from the chamber, but also to dissolve it in the first place. This is a really complicated slide, so we'll start with the top left. That's the exterior elevation, so we're looking at the cave as if we're looking from the rock mass. And basically, the initial white lines through there show that what this passage was, was a two phreatic passages, one of which was a lift, and then a long downhill decline through it, and there was a tributary passage that came in. So here's now looking down on the, uh, on the uh, top of the chamber, again, external plan. Here's the tributary. There's the original lift up through there, and there are phreatic elements. And what subsequently happened after the formation of a nice stable arch, there's a nice stable arch that formed there, is that the stream has become uh, an uh, air surface stream. There has been vados entrenchment of it, but that vados entrenchment has been relatively limited. And so much of the original floor of the chamber is left as elements to the side here, and the vados trench has not taken out most of this central area. This is now a sort of 3D view of the, the floor of the chamber. So here's the Vados route going round. Through there, it's reversed in direction. There's the core, which is all bedrock of the meander. And there's this flank area through here. So we have to dissolve that out to get a big chamber. Belize chamber is not on the world's biggest list, simply because it's not being gutted enough. The bedrock hasn't been dissolved. The second issue we've got is as soon as big blocks drop, they have gaps between them. This is called bulking by engineers. And what it means is, if you continue to drop big blocks down into a, uh, into a void, you'll eventually fill the whole void up, and that will be the end of it. And we can see that in places like Carlista, which uh, Rue's shown you already. There's the external view of Carlista. This is what the floor like, looks like. You can see it's mirroring exactly the roof. And there's no active stream in Carlista at the moment. So all that material that's falling down is not physically being removed, and gradually the whole chamber is going to fill up and there won't be anything left there for us to see. It's the same in Miao. The reason that Miao is such a big chamber is that all this material that's coming from the roof and from speleotherm growth in the cave and from uh, plastic sediments that are being transported through is being picked up like an active stream which comes from a, uh, from a resurgence in the floor here and also by overflow, and it's being trucked out through to the entrance through there. So evacuation is a key thing in uh, getting large volume chambers. So what conditions give us effective evacuation? This is uh, in, uh, in China. It's the Fengshang Regional Geopark. Uh, it's got some of the big chambers we've measured. Hong Mei Gui here, number five. You see the area of limestone and the surrounding plastic rocks. Uh, it's a very big catchment area. Where's the number for the catchment area up there? 835 square kilometres, 30% of it's allergenic or so, so it's, it's aggressive water that hasn't seen limestone that's coming in and dissolving. Just to set this in context, the drainage area for the, uh, for the whole of the Mendips is about 320 kilometres, 13.5% uh, of which is allergenic. So we're talking very, very big catchments. Very big catchments, very big runoff, efficient streams, good at evacuation, both bedrock and the debris that falls from the roof. When you have a look at that map that um, Rue produced, you can see that the majority of the chambers actually are in a relatively narrow band quite close to the equator. And the reason for this is quite simple. That's where it's wettest, and that's where the high temperatures give you more carbon dioxide in the soils and more potential for dissolution. This is the first site we went to scan in China, and, uh, and it's probably my, the world, my favorite cave in the world because all these mechanical processes are set out not somewhere 300 meters above your head in the total dark, but in the daylight where you can actually see them going on. And one of the interesting things about this, this cave is that you can see the way that a relatively small, stable arch developed over an individual passage eventually becomes engulfed by progressively larger arches. And so where you have multiple passages coming together, eventually you go from individual small arches like this to something which overarches the whole thing and gives you an, an enormous chamber. So one of the conclusions of the work is that large chambers tend to form where you have several passages intersecting. 
we've got to remove all the debris, both the sediment that's being transported in by the cave rivers and by the material that falls uh, from the roof. Wide chambers that are not very high have stable arches and give us very, very big spans. So Sarawa chamber, the queer, clear winner through here. Whereas cantilever beam ceilings allow us to go relatively high as long as you've got the thickness of limestone and the thickness of unsaturated zone able to do that. Andy, that's... Many, many people to thank. Um, I hope I've got everybody there. Um, this sounds sometimes like it's a sort of four-person act. It is not. Lots of people to thank. I particularly want to thank a couple of people in the room. Zhang Hai from the uh, Cast Institute of China um, for all his help with the stuff in China. For, to Erin, both in China and latterly in the United States uh, as well. So thank you very much to those for all the help. So just to conclude our little talk, a fun little fly through which seems to have disappeared. There we are. Thank you very much, everybody.